Woe to the teachers of the law, the day of the saints is here. Woe to the Welcome to God the News Network, where the saints the are rising, where we are here to fulfill the word of God. The mystery which has been hidden from ages and from generations, but now has been revealed to his saints. Are you a saint? How do you find out? By listening to God News Network and, of course, the Holy Spirit, which is God himself trying to have a conversation with you if you just have ears that hear and eyes that see. Welcome once again. I'm St. Rick coming to you live here at God News Network from the big state, the flat state, the second flattest state in the United States. Yes, that is correct. That is Illinois. And with my wonderful partner from South Carolina, that would be St. Albert. How are you doing, brother? Great, Rick. Great, Rick. Uh, I'm coming from you from a bumpy state, <laughs> which is <laughs> South Carolina. <laughs> bumpy, we don't have those big mountains, but we have a lot of hills. <laughs> <laughs> I like that word, bumpy. Oh, man. What incredible news has been going on around the world the last day and day and a half. The world is turning upside down on top of the head of the elites. Can you believe that? incredible stuff here. Well, what I want to do is take the time to give you a little bit of information coming from the Reuters news, which is about the Donald Trump situation, Brexit, now Texas. Yes, Texas is stirring it up down there, talking about or seceding from the United States. If we take a look at it, it says Reuters emboldened by Brexit, U.S. secessionists in Texas are keen to adopt the campaign tactics used to sway the British vote for leaving the European Union and are demanding Texas comes next. The citizen-driven vote in Britain can be a model for Texas, which was an independent country from 1836 to 1845, and its $1.6 trillion a year economy would be among the 10 largest in the world. Many people don't know that about Texas, that they truly are by themselves in the top 10 largest economies in the entire world. So that would put them as one of the largest countries in the world. Um, said Daniel, uh, President, uh, or Daniel Miller, who is the president of the Texas Nationalist Movement, the Texas National Movement is formally calling on the Texas governor to support a similar vote for Texans. The group said on Friday, the office of Texas governor, Greg Abbott, was not immediately available for comment. The group, which claims about a quarter million supporters, failed earlier this year to place a vote on the secession on November ballot, but aims to relaunch its campaign for the next election cycle in 2018, buoyed by the British vote. In other words, kept afloat. For those of you who do not know what buoy means, Texas is in the air, he said. Texas for Texas exit is a play on the British exit Brexit and was trending on Twitter in the United States on Friday. Yeehaw! Brexit shows how to get it done. Now we need a Texit, tweeted user Philip Paulson at Paulson Philip. Constitutional scholars, however, say a U.S. state cannot break away. But this has not stopped hundreds of secessionist schemes throughout the nation's history. No state has been formed by seceding from another since 1863 when West Virginia was created during the Civil War. From Maine to Alaska, the bids to break away by groups often angry at taxation or what they see as an infringement of their liberties have been unsuccessful either due to the nearly impossible legal challenges or lack of support. A 2014 Reuters uh, poll showed nearly a quarter of Americans are open to their states leaving the union. This is pretty amazing. It seems to be, you know, Donald Trump lands in Scot Scotland and this morning he has a live, live conference. And one of the things he talks about is how um, 
it seems to be a movement across the United States. And a lot of you who are normally listening to us at saintswithoutwalls.com may be thinking, what is this? How does this play into what's going on around the world in Christ? And it doesn't feel like a normal church situation. Well, our format's changing here a little bit. And we kind of want to let you know that it's just going to change a little bit to fit in with what's happening around the world combined with learning about Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer. He's the focus. He's the center of everything we do here. And trust me, hang on. We will show you how he is at the center of all of this, including what we're dealing with. But when we get involved with religion, how can you not relate that to what's going on around the world? The only reason that you can't relate to it, what's going on around the world is because you just aren't seeing what's in the Bible because Everything relates. It all relates. And you know what? Imagine sitting in a church every day for the next 50 years, twiddling your thumbs and not talking about real events that's going on. How would that play? You know, you'd feel like a zombie. It doesn't feel real. And I don't know, Albert, what's your take on that whole deal? Well, you know, you will think that uh, Jesus uh, was the type of person that uh will go to the synagogue and just sit there and, and just listen and and that will be it, you know, and just read the scriptures and read. But, you know, Jesus in a lot of occasions, he uh, predicted what was going on at the day and also what was going to happen in the future and what happened in the past too. So he was very aware of the things and situations that were occurring because those situations were occurring again uh, uh, around his people, you know. So don't think that Jesus Christ went to the houses of the so-called sinners and sat down and talk, and opened up the scrolls. He brought 13 or 14 scrolls on his hand, and the people there sat down and said, oh, brother, here comes Jesus with the scrolls, you know. We we're going to have wine and just talk about the scrolls. Well, that wasn't, that wasn't really it. Uh, Jesus Christ talk to the people. He enjoyed and listened to what the people of the day, what was going on in the day, and, and, and related that to his message. And it's, it's the same message that we have right now. We still have to relate to the people. Rick, a lot of people come to us, to Christians, and, and uh, I mean, just in the, in the past month, I had like three or four people come to me and tell me, Albert, you know, what do you think that's going on? How do you relate this to the gospel? Tell me about prophecy. People are very interested as to what is going on to the, uh, in this world and, and, and how does it relate to me or how, to, how does it relate to Christ? So, you know, we have a lot of notions about Christ that are not really true, you know, uh, we think that even the notion that Christ did not enjoy himself, you think that Christ sat down in those feasts and did not enjoy himself? He did. He enjoyed himself with people. He wasn't, I, I, I would say, he wasn't a sourpuss. He, <laughs> he was a person who enjoyed. He enjoyed parties. In fact, he enjoyed parties so much that when we get to heaven, that's what we're going to have. We're going to have parties constantly, constantly. And those parties are going to be parties, yes, for those who are legalists. There is going to be wine involved in those parties. And if, <laughs> and if, and if, if history shows the future, uh, guess what? Whenever you have a chance, go ahead and look at the Old Covenant, at the tithings, and you will find out the one of the three tithings talks about hard liquor in the temple. Ooh, <laughs> boy, that's going to hurt a lot of people. Well, don't blame me for that. You know, argue it with Christ because Christ was the one who permitted this. Hard liquor in the temple. <laughs> don't take my word for it. Go back and read the Bible in the Old Testament. So, well, when Jesus turned the water into wine, he made 3,500 glasses of wine, if you do the math of the Old Testament. Yeah. Yeah. Or in the New Testament, when his mother was like, we're out of wine. You know, yeah. he was like, 
why are you worried? You know, we got plenty of wine. Here you go, 3,500 glasses. And that was his first miracle, wasn't it? It was. It was. And, and, uh, and you know, yes, I, you know, I understand that we should not get drunk, but we should not put laws and state that they're God's laws. Jesus did drink, and he allowed people to drink. Yeah. He just doesn't want people to act like fools when you get drunk, but you could drink. There's nothing wrong with it. And uh, so anyways, getting back to this uh, situation with what was going on in the world, what's going on in the world, you know, it is freedom. What happened over there is freedom. Yes, they might lose a couple of dollars, but that's just what you have to do. Sometimes freedom costs, and it costs hard. And, and God willing, we will follow that freedom here in the United States. Uh, you know, I don't know if uh, a lot of our listeners uh, know this, Rick, but, uh, you know, I was born in Cuba. And uh, as a little kid, I went through the revolution in Cuba. And not just that. I lived in Mexico for three and a half years. So I understand what's going on in the Latin American countries. And I understand the governments of uh, uh, what is occurring over there. And I'm going I'm to give you a little story for the listeners. So they, they will know what's going on, okay? And, and what's going on over there, guess what? It's starting to go on in the United States. I'm going to give you a little tour first about Cuba so the listeners will understand what, goes, what went on in Cuba, okay? Now, now, if you're listening to this, I want you to pay attention because this gentleman here, he's lived it. He's from there. He knows what it's like to be a part of this Cuban thing. And really, that's what your government right now in the United States is trying to shoot for. They're trying to take you down this road to take away freedoms. And ultimately, they want to eliminate what? The freedom of Christ. Matter of fact, it's so evident that now in California, and, and, and sorry for the little uh, side bunny trail here, Albert, but it, it all relates to where you're going. And in California, now they've come down in the state, wants to tell Christian colleges that you can't force people in a Christian college that they would have allegiance with Christ. They're forcing them in California to say, they're telling them you cannot tell your students that they have to be in a relationship with Jesus Christ. If they specifically picked that out, which is, Interesting, especially when the Muslims just released another list of those to attack. There's several in the United States, there's several in Britain to attack, and even says in their uh, dialogue that they we must go after those uh, of the cross, specifically mentioning the cross. And Jesus said, they hated me, they're going to hate you on account of me. You're so right, Rick. I mean, this is what's coming over here, and it's here already. It's just being hidden uh, and covered up by all the things. So share, share, with our, share with our listeners where you're going here. Give us a tour. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, Rick, I, I was born in the middle of the revolution, and um, my dad lived here in the United States. He went to uh, college here, and he went to high school here in the United States, and he went back to Cuba to try to uh, – get his inheritance before everything corrupted over there. Uh, <laughs> but he was, he got married and they had me and, and so they had to stay a longer time. But basically what happened in Cuba was that uh, we had governments after governments after governments that were completely corrupt. Cuba had a lot of trade with the United States and the money that was coming into Cuba was, was really going to, to, to corporations, really. Uh, and those corporations were buying off the representatives of the Cuban people. And so corruption and top of corruption and top of corruption led a, a revolt of uh, two people. Uh, one person was a person who wanted a, a, to have a revolution, but to kick out the dictator and bring back freedom. 
But what happened was that uh, Batista and Fidel Castro both fought about uh, both fought this person and killed them. So what ended up was Batista, a corrupt government, and Fidel Castro, which was a communist. When uh, Fidel Castro uh, came down uh, from the mountains with a handful of people, uh, the Cuban people uh, went wild for him. Why? Because, uh, because he was coming in and saying that he was giving the people freedom. But in true reality, he was already planning with the Russians. Uh, a lot of people in my family died at that time. Uh, we lost everything. Uh, religion was taken away. Uh, Christianity was taken away. That was, that was one of the first things that was uh, taken away from Cuba. And the, and the guns, uh, everything went. Uh, and basically, what people say is, well, you know, this is a state of communism and everything. But really, what the world is doing is that they're using a flag of communism to hide corruption in the highest levels in government. And, uh, and that's what's occurring in Cuba. What's occurring in Cuba right now, just to let you know, what's occurring in Cuba right now is that you have a handful of people saying that they're communist, and then you have a handful of corporations, global corporations from Europe and different places coming in there, paying off uh, those people, and uh, and uh, nothing goes to the to the people of Cuba. Everything goes to those people, and uh, and the people are starving. So we, since, have, we have the elite at the top in the government realm. That's correct. Doing very well, and only thing that seems to be affected are the people below, and nothing ever affects the elite at the top. That's correct. Those people at the top, they get to travel. They've always gone to travel. If they got sick. They, uh, they've gone to hospitals around the world. They talk about Cuba having a, a real good health system. Well, there's not, even, there's not even a Band-Aid in the hospitals in Cuba, okay? And then what happens, the reason why the people keep quiet is because the corruption, the same corruption that the government had, they extended it to the people and bought out the people because what happens was that... Um, they uh, gave people houses that then belonged to them. They stole the houses from, from, uh, from the original owners. And so they gave those houses to the people. And so now those people were cut up in the scheme. You see? And mm -hmm. then the way that the, most of the people eat in Cuba is through the black market. If somebody... Uh, works in a shoe factory from the government. He will steal some shoes. And then if some, and some other person works for, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the meat packers, he was, that person will steal meat, and they will exchange in the black market those shoes for that meat, you see? The, the government knows this too, but they, they close their eyes to keep the people at hand. So the people live out of corruption, because the government lives out of corruption. So that's the system in Cuba. That is the system that's right now in Cuba. So it's forcing people who are starving to break laws that puts themselves and their families at risk because they're, they don't have the freedom and the opportunities to earn themselves, to you know, to become self-reliant. That's correct. So the self-reliancy, there's no hope. They're taking away their hope because you don't have a hope of a better life. So what's left? Nothing. That's it. And, and, and they can't do anything about it because since they're in this system of corruption, what happens is that they will be afraid that they will take that house that doesn't belong to them they will take it's, if a new government will come in. They will take the house that doesn't belong to them away, or, you know, uh, if you if you look at the movies in Cuba that are coming out from the island, you will look outside and you will think that every day is a Sunday or a Saturday because everybody's in the street because nobody's working. 
because they're all living out of a government's handout, you see? So mm. that government handout, the way they do it is that, uh, you know, they work a couple hours in, in uh, the factory and that's it, that's the day. And they bring some things home and they exchange those things for other goods, you know, that other people might have. And, and money that comes from, uh, from families in Miami, uh, they, a lot of people live out of that. Uh, so that's the standard of life in Cuba. And that type of life, unfortunately, uh, you know, goes into other places in, 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 in uh, Latin America. Uh, you know, in Latin America, I lived in Mexico. And, uh, and not that same life, but it's, it's a pretty similar life. What happens in Mexico is that the Mexican government is completely corrupt completely corrupt. All the money that comes in from the United States that's, that's sent to Mexico to help the Mexican people, what happens is that the top officials there keep the money. And nothing gets to the people. Nothing gets to the people. The people of Mexico are, they don't have any rights. They don't have nothing. That's why they have to come to the United States. They have to come to the United States because where they are from, they have no rights. So believe it or not, the rights that they have in the United States as, a, as an undocumented person is a hundred times more rights that they have over there in their country. So they have to come over here. The corruption in Mexico is so much that uh, the people won't realize that. And I lived this. I lived through this. Uh, let's say that you have a thief that goes out and steals in the street, okay? And that thief is captured, okay? Well, you will think that that thief will go into jail, but that, that's, that's not what happens in Mexico. What happens in Mexico in some of these places is that the sergeant in charge of that jail will talk to the thief and says, okay, I caught you stealing now, okay? Now, you're gonna be working for me, okay? You're going to be working for me. And you're going to have to bring in a percentage of money of what you steal up there. So the thief goes out again and starts stealing. But now he's working for the government. And those things go on in Mexico all the time. My dad used to say that in the United States, when they collect the taxes and they want to build a road, the uh, government here will steal maybe a quarter of that, but the one who comes in afterwards will finish the rope because they'll collect more taxes. But in places like Mexico, what happens is that the person who comes in steals the whole money and there's nothing left to do that road. So the next person that comes in into the office comes in and tells them that they need more money for the road. And he comes in and he steals again from all the money from the road. And it keeps on going. Mexico and some of these uh, uh, nations out there are the richest nations. Mexico has gold. It has silver. It has oil. Mexico could be richer than the United States. But the reason that Mexico is not rich is because the government is so corrupted that they keep everything. Hmm. So that's what's occurring in Mexico. So, so what, 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 what's going on with the border? What's going on on the border here in the United States is easy. Is easy. What we we're doing is that we're feeding the corruption of the Mexican government because the people that, that they're stealing from, which is their people, have to come across the border in order to eat because their government has been stealing from them for years. And, 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 and you think that the drug problem is going to end in Mexico? That will never end. The government is so involved with that 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 will never end because there's money involved. So just so people will understand, and also our, 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 our brothers, our Spanish, are listening to us, that, th that what's happening with the American people is not against the migrants. It's not against the migrants. What's happening with the American people is that they're, the, the American people are very generous. They're very generous. There's a lot of Christians in the United States that give millions of dollars to help people around the world and their needs. 
But what's going on is that the governments around the world with global corporation globalism are taking advantage and trying to sink the United States into a third world uh, country. So they could enslave the people here just like they enslave them everywhere else, just like they enslave them in China, just like they enslave them in, in Central America, just like they enslave them everywhere, just everywhere. Everywhere, uh, and, and, and uh, just like they enslave them in, uh, in uh, the, the Middle East, just like they enslave them, uh, uh, you know, in all these Oriental countries, it's the, same, it's the same deal. This one world thing is, is terrible. And people are starting to wake up. You know, people are starting to wake up. Now, what about the United States, you say, Albert? I live here, too. I've lived here 50 years. So I understand also what's going on in the United States. And it's the same thing. Corruption in the government. Our representatives are compromised. They're compromised by corruption. They're compromised by money. Too much money is going into a federal government. And we're not seeing where that money goes. That money's going all over the place. And, 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 and a lot of times they say that that money is going to help people like in Mexico or help people in, in Africa and all that. And it's not. It's going to line up officials up there. It's going to buy and continuing on this with buying up the officials and all those other governments. So what we're doing is that we're helping. We're just not having corruption in our, in our governments. We're helping with the corruption in all the governments. Freedom is a situation where people right now all over the world are, are not experiencing the true freedom that was meant for all of us. And let's just take the world's view or the definition of freedom according to Google. So we pull up Google and we go, what is freedom? It's the power or right to act speak, or think as one wants without hindrance or restraint. Now, let's just apply the world's definition to the world situation. If you were to ask yourself, who is the most restricted class of people in the United States right now? What comes to mind? The most restricted class of people. Well, to me, the most restricted class of people, uh, I will say, you know, I'm going to generalize it more, and it's the citizens of the United States. Those are the most restricted. If you're not a citizen of the United States, you could get away with a lot of things, including yeah. not paying taxes. You know what's funny is how they take the um, – they've got all these organizations that represent certain races, Okay. So you have an organization that represents, you know, certain colleges, things like that. And now, of course, the new, the new uh, uh, law just was uh, affirmed through the Supreme Court that basically race will be counted in your decision in colleges to recruit people and things like that. You have to take that into consideration. To me, that perpetuates the problem. Now let's go to the spiritual side, because really all this leads back to Jesus. What I mean by that is, Albert, your story is amazing, because not many people get to hear firsthand how that plays out, how you know someone who's lived the oppression, who's lived those kinds of issues, um, who's seen it firsthand, been a part of it. And how did it make you feel to know that there's no hope, to know that there's nothing that you can do to break free from that? And did it, I mean, you know, do you blame the people for wanting to turn to corruption? I mean, because of the way the government's handling things. I mean, do you feel it's a blame to do that? The people, the people have to eat, uh, Rick. You know, the people have to eat. What happens is that they have they put the people in a situation that that uh, that that they cannot get out of it, or or it's really hard to get out of, and they do it on purpose because they don't want them getting out of the situation that they're in. You know, 
because they like control and dominance over the people. That's right. And, and what they do is that they compromise, they compromise the people. Mm-hmm. So the people get, since the, the government itself is already compromised because of the bribes they have and the money that they're stealing and the control that they're having, uh, what they do is that they have to corrupt the people that they live on, that live under them. You see, because if the people on the live on the net is not corrupted, then they will have a problem. So that's what we're having. That's what we're having here in the United States. We're having a corrupt government, right? Mm-hmm. And by the way, that government is not corrupted by itself because we have churches that are corrupted too with the government, and and are going with the government very easily in their corruption. They're turning a blind eye as to the people who they're voting for and the politicians that they're following. And, and, and you could see that in, in radio stations and everything. You cannot trust the media. Sometimes a lot of these conservative radios, you cannot trust them because they're in there, not because they're conservative. They're in there because of the wallet, because there's somebody backing them up. And that person who's backing them up is paying them. And the position is compromised, whichever. And that goes also with, uh, you know, with the Democratic uh, radios, you know. Uh, their positions, they're talking out of positions that are, are compromised. You know, I had, I had a conversation with. Uh, and, and why should we compromise? There's our belief. That's what they're asking us to do. See, if you think about it, compromising, okay, Let's just deal with radical Islam and Christianity. Do you believe it's possible for those two belief systems to come together? Rick, you know, <laughs> that is something that is incredible. You know, uh, you know, my ancestors are Spaniards. People forget, people forget that Spain was the last place where we had to kick the Moors out. Had to kick who out? The Moors. The, 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 this, this religion that we're having right now that's coming in, that's attacking us. Islam. That's right. Yeah. That's right. It's Europe, always been an issue. And if you go back to the founding fathers, they actually had to deal with the same problem. They were constantly battling how do we deal with this it's not going to change that's why people are relating to donald trump that's why people are relating because they're tired of people trying to make compromises because it only leads to oppression so what happens is is let's just face it belief system a and belief system b they're trying to pull together under one world belief system. It's not going to happen. Do you know, do you know Rick, that there's four, four courts in England, okay? Four courts in England of Sharia law? Legal mm-hmm. courts in England of Sharia law. Do you think that that's not going to happen here? Do you think that the thousands of years that Christianity has battled Islam, do you think that that's just going to be? Let me tell you something. What we're having here is a non-physical war with Islam in occasions here. They have tried in the past to get rid of Christianity by swords. And now they're trying to get rid of Christianity by politics. They're using our own, or they're using our, our, our liberties. They're using our liberties to kill us. Mm-hmm. They're using our liberties to kill us. You think that you think that uh, what they're teaching? You think that what they're teaching? Uh, all those Muslims that are coming in. You think that what they're teaching their kids is Christianity? <laughs> you think that they're telling their kids that we all should, you know, should be together and, and all that with the Christians? 
Hmm. That's not what's occurring, Rick. That is not what's occurring. What's occurring is that they're bringing Islam to the United States. And, and that might be a thing of the, uh, you know, the future, you know, this, this uh, one world Christian, you know, Christianity, like you said, you know, uh, I mean, they believe in Mary, they believe in all the prophets, they believe that Jesus Christ was a prophet. So now why not go with that? You know, why not go with that? But uh, that's what's occurring. That's what's occurring. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting crazy. It's getting out of control. And people don't even realize what, you know, like you hear see people talking about this Sharia law. Well, what I want to show you here is pretty amazing. And most people do not have a clue what this is. So let's look at this real quick. This is part of Sharia law. Number one, jihad defined as to war against non Muslims. So we pick the subject of the war. It's against whom? Non-Muslims. Okay. Does that include pretty much everybody in the United States? Yes. And why? It says to establish the religion. It's the duty of every Muslim and Muslim head of state, which is the caliph, Muslim caliphs who refuse jihad are in violation of Sharia and unfit to rule. A caliph can hold office through seizure of power, meaning through force. A caliph is exempt from being charged with serious crimes such as murder, adultery, robbery, theft, drinking, and in some cases of rape. A percentage of zakat, charity, money, must go towards jihad. So let's say you're a Muslim and you make X amount of dollars. A percentage of that money must go towards jihad. It is obligatory to obey the commands of the caliph, even if he is unjust. And, you know, Rick, it's so funny because what they're using now is that they're saying that we're prejudiced. You know, the people who don't believe this, that we should all live together are prejudiced. Well, let, try the person who says that, that this is prejudice, try them to go to Saudi Arabia and open up a Christian church over there. Or to <laughs> another Muslim, uh, you know, country over there and open up a church. And see, and see how, how, uh, <laughs> how this will work out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I could no. tell you right now, it's not going to work out too good. You'll probably end up probably missing a head or missing your arms, <laughs> missing your family. Yeah. Or maybe your family might wonder where you're at because you haven't come home in 10 days. You see, these people who are talking and coming over here and saying that uh, this is prejudice and that, uh, and that what we're doing is that we're saying things because we... Uh, we hate all the people and all this, you know, uh, they're using that against the Christians and against the people of this country and against the people of the world. Because in true reality, what they're expecting from us, they will never expect us to go over there and do the same thing. Never. And it will never happen. No, no. It will never happen. No. Even Saudi Arabia, so-called Saudi Arabia, that they're our best body, supposedly, you know, but they're, they're, they got to follow the same ideology. They, they have to correct. follow the same ideology. That's correct. For example, continuing along what they believe, a caliph must be a Muslim, a non-slave, and a male. The Muslim public uh, must remove the caliph if he rejects Islam. A Muslim who leaves Islam must be killed. What? Immediately, here's a woman, a Muslim woman, receiving Sharia justice. She's about to be stoned to death. Now, how does this contrast with what Christ did? Remember, we lead everything back to Christ. Mary was about to be stoned to death for a, a law in, that in Islam would require you to stone her to death. What he did was basically said, those of you without sin may cast the first stone. No one cast the first stone. A Muslim will be given, forgiven of murder um, 
are for murder of an apostate, an adulterer, a highway robber, a vigilante street justice, and an honor killing is acceptable. A Muslim will not get the death penalty if he kills a non-Muslim, but will get it for killing a Muslim. So they don't get death penalty in their own country for killing, period, as long as you're not a Muslim, right? The yeah. Do you remember, uh, not just uh, just this past week, this lady got raped over there. And she went to the authorities to tell her about her rape. You know what they did to the lady? They arrested her. <laughs> and you can't tell them. That, you can't tell them. A Sharia, Sharia law never abolished slavery. It never abolished sexual slavery and highly regulates it. A master will not be punished for killing his slave. Sharia dictates death by stoning, beheading, amputation of limbs, flogging, even for crimes of sin such as adultery. Look at this guy, right? A Muslim man receiving Sharia justice, a public flogging, which is more than likely killed him. Non-Muslims are not equal to Muslims under law. They must comply to Islamic law if they are to remain safe. They are forbidden to marry Muslim women. Publicly display wine or pork. They are also forbidden to recite their scriptures or openly celebrate their religious holidays or funerals. They are forbidden from building new churches or building them higher than mosques. They may not enter a mosque without permission. Non-Muslim is no longer protected if he leads a Muslim away from Islam. Think about it. This is Sharia law. And they want that in England? No. The people are finally had enough. 72% of the people voted. They stood up over 30 million people, the largest turnout ever of all time. And then they voted free us from the European Union. Here's why I like Trump. I'm just going to say it. God News Network supports Trump. That's just the way it is. If you don't like it, don't listen. Here's the way it is. He is the only leader in our nation that's running for president or has been president that agreed with the people of England. If you ask uh, Obama, he actually went over there and said, you better get in the back of the line if you vote to leave the European Union. When that's incredible. Creating with the United States. Christ God knew that we needed freedom. God knew that we also needed freedom. That's what I believe is happening and stirring in the hearts of people. And I think we're about to see more people come to Christ than ever in the history of mankind. Because Christ represents the ultimate freedom. And isn't it funny, at the same time the California thing is going on against the Christian churches underneath the earth in California, the San Andreas Fault is about to blow. It's moving, and scientists are going berserk at how much it's moving, and they are not sure what to do. Well, I'm sorry, but God still exists. He's alive, and he will have his way, whether you believe it or whether you don't believe it. And let's contrast what we're reading about the Sharia law to what we're dealing with with Christianity. They stone a woman, Christ keeps her from being stoned. Which one showed the most love? Islam, as a religion, in the Sharia law, tells you that it is forbidden to marry Muslim women. Where's the freedom in that? Where is the freedom to display certain things? And it tells you that you have to kill. I mean... A Muslim must be removed from the caliphate if he rejects Islam. If you reject Christianity, what are they going to do? Hmm. They're not going to kill you. They're not going to do that. A Muslim who leaves Islam must be killed immediately in the Sharia law. In Christianity, we love you. We want you to be a part of it, but that's between you and God. God will judge you. God will deal with that whole deal, you know? You know, uh, Rick, you know, we have talked about this before, you know, that basically what we have out in the world and, and for all our audience, whether, you know, regardless who you are, whether you're Spanish or, or you're somebody from the United States, a, a white man or somebody, uh, an Arab or whoever you are, you got to realize so you won't get fooled again 
I, I love that song. There's a, a song that from the seventies that I love. Don't get fooled again. That's right. So you won't get fooled again, because I will hate for you to leave something like this and walk away into another trap. Yeah. Okay. Uh, you have to be very careful because most if not all the religions of the world, no matter which religion, even Christian religions, okay, what they have is that they have a form, the Bible calls it a form of really, uh, uh, you know, being religious, you know, but there's no substance to it. What they try to bring you is into men's laws and laws that are not binding anymore. And that's what that's what really that's what really Islam is. Islam is a combination of mosaic laws with men's laws, which they themselves, no matter who you're talking to, no matter if it's a high person or a whole, low person, or whoever, they themselves cannot keep. They themselves cannot keep those laws, but yet they try to enforce those laws on you. And in religion. That's what they do, including in Christianity. There are some religious and Christianities that they try to inform also a combination of, of Mosaic law, which Christ has taken away, with some of men's laws. I mean, we were just talking about, not too long ago, here with me and Rick, we were talking about, you know, I don't know if most people here are listening that they're, you know they're older than us, but we had a a, a thing here in uh in the United States called prohibition. You know, and then prohibition. What what happened was that this religion's re religious Christian people decided to step in and say that God does not allow for drinking. So they embarked on putting in federal laws that restricted everybody from drinking. You see, because God then allowed that, which is a complete falsehood, because neither in the, neither in the Old Testament or in the New Testament it has anything like that. Okay, and just to, so you see how far this goes, there was a time here in the United States where, when the uh, there was a, a thing that I love very much, which is called the float, which is uh, <laughs> a scoop of vanilla ice cream with uh, soda, uh, cola, or, or uh, root beer. And I'll tell you, it is sinful, Rick. <laughs> I love it. Sounds like it. <laughs> well, they got together and they said that that was so good that it was sinful, so it had to be taken out, away from, uh, from, uh, from uh, you know, drinking it on, <laughs> on Sundays. So that's where the Sunday came out. <laughs> we all know about the Sunday ice cream. Well, they say, well, okay, this, this is permissible. And there's other idiotic uh, things that they come out with. And uh, so I'm saying to you, so you will understand that when Christ set you free, he set you free indeed. Amen. And you don't need laws and rules and regulations from God for you to know what's right and what's wrong. You don't need a law to tell you not to steal from your neighbor. You don't need a law to say to be hateful to any person. You don't need a law to tell you that you must help somebody who's in need. You don't need laws for that. You know what's in your heart. You do not need a law for that. Let me tell you, if you need a law for that, you might as well forget it. You might as well forget it because all those things... God, God requires all those things, not from laws. He requires those things from the heart. And the let's, law could never give you that. Let's see what God says about it. Matter of fact, if you go to 1 Corinthians and you go to chapter 13, God is love, first of all. The Bible tells us very clearly that God is love. And let's see what he says. He says, love suffers long. Love is kind. If you see somebody not being kind, then you know they're not operating from love. It isn't a rule. It isn't a law. You just know. Love does not envy. Love doesn't parade itself around, boast, or be arrogant, or puffed up. 
Love does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own will. It is not provoked. And in a matter of fact, it thinks no evil. So if you see people thinking evil, let's look, what, look what's going on today, just for example, in the House of Representatives where the former speaker, Nancy Pelosi, was asked to be removed while they did a security sweep in the House of Representatives. And Nancy said, that's not going to happen. And they stood there and they're not going to be removed. They're thinking evil thoughts. See, that's how they do it. See, if they lose and they lose something that they didn't win, then they start t throwing a temper tantrum and trying to use the guilt card to make people feel guilty. And it's just bogus of what they do. This is evil, not a certain party. This is how evil operates. We're not getting into the party game because they both got their problems. They both got their faults. Love does not rejoice in iniquity. In other words, when someone is having their suffering, love does not rejoice in that. Love, but it rejoices in the truth. That's why another reason we like Donald Trump. Whether you like what he says or not, he believes what he says is the truth, and, you're, and that's what it is. Now, he may get new information and change his mind about what happens, but it's still the truth. And that's what happens. And he ends up speaking what he believes to be the truth. The thing I like about the truth is Christ is the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail, possibly. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, we know that which is perfect, which is Christ, has come. But when that which is perfect has come, in other words, that when Christ has come, then that which is in part will be done away with. What is that? That's the law. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. It's immediately he follows up with this because when you're trying to live by the law, by the rules, and what's the purpose of the government? They just want to force all these rules and all these laws down on people. What for what purpose to keep you in submission? That's why the elite are so upset of what's going on in England. That's why the people are so upset of what's going on in the United States. The elite, they're freaking out right now. Yeah. Well, what's happening, Rick, you know, the governments, you know, they're put in place, you know, to help us. But what's happened with the government that, that, that we're having around the world is that they're corrupted. And the laws that are coming out of from them are corrupted. They're mm -hmm. lost against the people, you know. So they're neither, they're neither keeping people in check the way that they're supposed to, keeping order. They're, what they're doing is that they're promoting, they're promoting un, uh, unstable uh, societies because they're, they're, their positions are corrupted. They're corrupted positions. And if we go to Proverbs for a second, uh, if you don't mind, just for a second, Proverbs 29, 4, it says, A just king gives stability to his nation, but one who demands bribes destroys it. And that's what's happening to our, to our country. Uh, and also in uh, Deuteronomy 16, 18 through 20, you know, it talks about this corruption. It talks about the corruption of bribes. And that's what we're having in the country. And that's what's happening in Mexico. That's what's happening in Europe. The government, their positions of the officials, they're supposed to be serving the people because that's who they are. They're servants of the people. What they're actually doing is that the people are serving them. That's what's happening, and, and Christ talks about this. Christ talks about the difference of his government from the governments of the earth. The governments of the earth, you know, the, they, the kings want to be served by the people. But the government of God is completely different because the king serves the people. Those people who think that they're going to go to her, heaven and be served by people, you're mistaken because... When you go in heaven and you are an official in heaven, what you're going to be doing is serving people. You're going to be serving the people underneath you. Hmm. Well, 
In Romans 5.13, it says, For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. So we look at laws and how can they, if they, and what's funny is they make laws that are not applicable to themselves Hmm. in leadership. When Christ came down and took all the punishment for you, when the Christ came down and took all the punishment for us, he took all the punishment of breaking the law, which he did not do. He took all the punishment of sin, which he did not do on himself. So the man who was without sin took on sin so that the man without sin could impute righteousness to us by taking on our sins on him and our punishment on him and then rose from the grave to victory. That's why evil hates the cross, because you can't go back and stop it now. It's done. He won. The victory is already over. And if you want to partake in the victory, we ask that you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior by saying, I believe in his death, his burial, and his resurrection for my sin. And I believe upon the name of Jesus Christ as my Lord and my Savior. If you have said that prayer, then you are now part of the family. And we're going to do something here. We're going to take communion. And we're going to do this each and every service that we do and every show that we do here on God News Network. Because we think it's a very important part of just being in remembrance of what Christ did for us and the power that comes through communion, the power that came through Christ. And he gives us a way to experience that power here on earth by remembering him. For the Lord uses the simple things on earth to confound the wise. In other words, men who think they're wise God uses the simple things to just absolutely baffle their brain, which is why they can't stand what's going on around the world right now. So if you happen to have bread, grab your bread. This bread is representation of the body of Christ. We ask that you think of something that is ailing you and see this bread as you take it, that it's your healing because as his body was broken, yours was healed. In the name of Jesus, you may partake. And this is the blood of the new covenant. You can take this and you can look at this as the remission of sins. So everything that you've ever done wrong, it's been completely dealt with by his blood on the cross. And all you have to do is just be grateful and thankful that Jesus died on the cross for us. You may drink. Hallelujah. Well, as we get to wrap up here, time's running short, Albert. We've got about a minute. Any parting words you have for our audience? Yeah, Rick, I just want to, you know, thank all of you guys for always being here with us and enjoying Jesus Christ. Uh, remember that he came because he loved us. He came because he thought of himself lesser, his life less than what he thought of our, our lives. He thought of our lives so highly that he came and gave his life for us. So he, God loves us and he wants to have a reunion with us and have a fellowship with us out of love, not out of laws and rules and regulations. That's religion. That's what the world wants to give you. He came for fellowship with you. And that fellowship is never lost, regardless how you feel. So remember this. Trust him with all your heart because he loves you. He loves you. He does. He loves you with all of his heart. And that would be his son that he gave for us on the cross. If you're hearing this today and you're at saintswithoutwalls.com, keep in mind, 
it's always about Christ. We're just doing it in a little bit different way than you're used to at your local church. And for those of you who are going to continually join us, you are blessed always and forever in the name of Jesus Christ. We love you. Saints are rising.